Hello, welcome to FT8 and FT4 digital sound card modes, an introduction. My name is Anthony Luskery, Kilo 8 Zulu Tango. I've been a ham since 1981. I'm currently serving as the AWRL Ohio Section Youth Coordinator. And my favorite part of amateur radio is operating. I like to operate on all modes. I love QRP. I enjoy contesting and I enjoy DXing. This is my contact information. I have a website, www.kilo8zulutango.com, where I have a wide variety of resources for amateur radio operators. Today's subject is quite involved, and the slideshow I'm doing right now is very short. I have a full slideshow with over 100 slides at tiny.cc slash FT8FT4. When you go there, you'll also be able to click on all the embedded links. Just look for the little link sign, and that will provide you information. So what is FT8? What is FT4? I'm guessing most of you that are reading this have heard about FT8 or FT4 from other hams, or you've heard it on the air. And this is what it sounds like. This is FT8. And this is FT4. And probably no one was able to decode those in their head because these are sound card modes that require a computer to be able to uh, decode them. Sorry for that slight pause. I had to pause the recording because the train was going by so you would have heard another noise in addition to FT8 and FT4. So FT8 is one of the fastest growing modes of amateur radio. It's been hard to miss, uh, but you may be wondering how you can get involved with it and what you need to do to get started. But first, who's responsible for this mode? Uh, WSJTX software, the suite that contains FT8, FT4, and other software, was originally developed by the Nobel laureate Joe Taylor, K1JT. Other prominent developers include Steve Frank, K9AN, and Bill Somerville, G4WJS. It's an open source product project, so you can also contribute to the project yourself. Why do I do FT8 and FT4? It's my multitasking mode. While I'm reading email, working with a computer, it's great for my QRP signal, my low power signal, and it increases my DXCC totals, worked all states totals, and QSO totals on the less used bands, uh, particularly six meters, 12 meters, 17, 30, and 60. You'll notice, for example, on 60 meters, over 98% of my activity has been on FT8 and FT4. It also allows me to use bands that are often that often seem dead. So if you've been worrying about using the upper bands during the sunspot sunspot low, I can assure you that FT8 and FT4 are a way to get active on those now. Some of the other reasons why I do FT8 and FT4, as I said, I you operate with five watts all the time, and I have a rather marginal antenna for 160, a mere 60 foot sloper. And this has allowed me to increase uh, my totals on DXCC on 160. And it's also allowed me to work all states on 160. My best DX so far on 160 has been UA0s in Siberia, uh, ZSs in South Africa, and uh, E51 in uh, North Cook Island. As I mentioned earlier, this allows me to operate on what some people think it's dead bands, 12, 10, and 6 during the sunspot low. And I also actually wrote a letter, an article for my local club's newsletter on working 12, 6, and 10 uh, with no sunspot cycles using eSkip. So you might want to read that article. And again, the links are all in the main slide presentation. In three years during the sunspot low, I've got DXCC on three bands. I've worked all states on eight bands. Uh, I've got over 14,000 14, QSOs, and all my QSOs are with five watts or less. On worked all states, I'm getting very close to 11 band worked all states with five watts in FT8 and FT4. I need five more band state combinations to finish up my worked all states. As you can see, I still need Alaska on six meters, Hawaii on 12, 10, and six, and I still need Montana on 10. Hopefully by the time you listen to this, uh, which is pre-recorded, I'll have worked those and I have my 11 band uh, worked all states. Uh, I know some of you may have very limited antennas and 
FT8 and FT4 are great for people that have homeowner uh, limited antennas, uh, indoor antennas, temporary antennas, mobile antennas, etc. Uh, because these these modes have the ability to work with very low signals, they are very good with these temporary portable antennas. Also, because FT8 and FT4, once you get to the band you won't choose, you plop down on one frequency and you're not constantly retuning your radio. So that means if you're using a magnetic loop antenna such as the one illustrated to your right here, it means that you're not constantly retuning it. So that's one of the biggest problems with these magnetic loops is the fact you have to keep retuning every time you QSY. But you won't need to do that as much on FT8 and FT4. Many modes are involved in the WSJTX software suite, suite, including JT65, which I originally started working with, FT8 and FT4, which are the newcomers. Um, it can decode signals decibels below the noise floor. Sometimes the signals are so low below the noise floor that a human ear can't even hear them, and you can make a contact. These modes also add redundancy to the data. They send the same data over and over again during the, the transmission period so that even if you don't receive it one time, all the data can be recovered uh, with the re receiver. Messages typically are either decoded correctly or not decoded at all with a very high probability. So you're not gonna get the wrong call sign in the log, you're usually gonna get the correct call sign. In addition to using the software, it requires tight synchronization of your computer time. So you need to make sure that your computer is time is well synchronized. As I said before, these two modes have not been around a long time. FT8 came out on June 29, 2017, so just over three years ago. And FT4 has been around for about a year, coming out in April of 2019. Um, the biggest differences between the two modes, transmission time. Transmission times for FT8 are approximately 15 seconds per cycle, and those for FT4 are about half as long, 7.5 seconds, as opposed to the one minute required for JT65. So here's a little uh, chart showing the decoding capability. You notice JT65 is the most sensitive of these, but FT8 and FT4 are definitely no slackers at minus 20 dB and minus 18 dB, as opposed to single sideband, which takes up full plus 10 dB. So you can notice we have a tremendous difference in the need for the signal strength uh, to be able to decode with these signals. This is a quick view of the screen's main working uh, portion, and it varies depending on which mode you're on slightly, but this is showing it with FT4 up on the screen right now, and we'll go into all these in detail. What can uh, WSJTX do? It can provide automatic logging of your contacts and uh, it allows easy transfer the, to an electronic log for Logbook of the World or EQSL. It lets you know where and how strong the signals you're, how strong you are being heard and it gives you the incoming signal strength of all the stations that you're working. Uh, works with almost any single sideband radio including VHF and UHF. What can't WSJTX do? Well, it's not suitable for rag chewing. It gives you about 14 characters per transmission. So basically all you can squeeze in is a call sign and a signal report and some inform and possibly a grid square. If you're interested in doing uh, longer QSOs with a similar type of program, JS8 Call is a piece of software that uses some of the same tools that are found in WSJTX, but allows you to do longer keyboard to keyboard communication. And most people that are doing longer chatting using digital modes using PSK31, which is a great keyboard to keyboard mode that lets you exchange a lot of information. Another thing WSJTX cannot do is it can't work without a computing device. It needs either a computer or in some cases possibly a tablet, but it doesn't work with a very simple, it doesn't work with the radio directly. And it will not work with a CW only radio because it needs to be able to change the tones in each of the transmissions. Um, so let's talk now about getting started with WJ, WSJTX and getting on FT8 and FT4. You basically need four things. You need an HF radio capable of single sideband transceive. You need a computer that's uh, either Windows 7 or later, Linux or OS 10. And because it operates on Linux, you can also use Raspberry Pis if it has sufficient amount of RAM. You need a sound card or sound card interface. Now, one of the things is some of the radios have this actually built into the radio, so you don't need that separately if your radio 
has that already built in. And you need some software, but all the software we're gonna be talking about today is all free software. So I put together a little chart here. This is for radios under $2,000 retail. And when you find these radios on sale, uh, sometimes you can find them even as low as 600, uh, $650 to $700. So these new radios are very inexpensive in a lot of cases. Um, the first column on the left, the green column, are radios that have a built-in sound card. So basically all you need to do is connect your radio using a USB cable and uh, you can operate these modes of operation through the sound card built into the radio. The second column, the red column, are radios that do not have a built-in sound card. So you would need a sound card interface, uh, interfacing unit to be able to use these. The radios in the yellow are radios that don't have a sound card built in, but they're designed so that they have proper isolation that you can simply hook up the audio cable between the radio and a sound card either in your computer or an external sound card. You don't need another interface and you can operate directly. Um, one of these, the Phaser single band kits for $55 is a single band, sing, uh, single um, sideband transceiver available for 80, 60, 40, 30, 20, or 17 meters, provides four watts of output power. And you simply hook up these two jacks, one to your sound card input, the other to your sound card output, and you can operate for a very inexpensive amount of money. So let's get started and talk about uh, the software. For WSJTX, uh, it's free software. You download it from the website. Uh, there's also some helper software you may want. You don't need these things, but they can be helpful. JT Alert or Alarm JT are two programs that help with identifying the stations you're working and sorting through the stations you've worked previously. Uh, you also need to install some software to maintain a highly synchronized computer time. Uh, the online monitoring spotting software called PSK Reporter and PSK uh, and um, a couple other programs that are available are online uh, websites, so you don't need to download anything those to be able to use those. So let's put it all together. First thing you need to do is set up your radio. Install your radio's driver software before you connect the cable between your radio and your computer. Don't hook up that USB cable just yet. Make sure you have all the current driver software installed on your computer before you do that. You may also need to adjust the baud rate of your radio and some other settings on your radio, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And in some cases, you have to tell your radio you want to turn on the interface to be able to use your uh, connection between the radio and the computer. Connect the interface cable once you have all the software installed. Determine the COM port of the radio and test the CAD operation to make sure that your computer and your radio are talking properly. Uh, you'll need to set some other settings in your radio, and there's a number of wonderful sites out there with information. I've listed some of them for some of the radios I've worked with and some of the friends I've helped out. And again, in the full presentation, these are all links that you can click on and go to that information. If your radio does not have a built-in sound card interface, you might need to add an external interface. And two of the most common are the Signal Link and the MFJ. Uh, the Tigertronic Signal Link, which is shown right here, uh, hooks up with one USB cable between your computer, and then you hook up uh, the Signal Link to your radio using a special cable. The, the MFJ is very similar. And again, there's some other ones also listed here. There are also interfaces available without sound cards built in, and they're rather inexpensive. And uh, those can be used within a simple, inexpensive sound card, such as this external sound card. I'd suggest you do not use your built-in sound card in your radio, in your computer, simply so that you, it doesn't uh, interfere with the sounds that are generated by your computer during normal operation, uh, the playback of videos, the uh, error messages, et cetera. So using an external sound card is a good way to keep those sounds separated. Doesn't need to be fancy. This under $10 sound card, uh, available in many mail order places will do just fine. So we need to set up our audio path. If the radio has a built-in sound card, we need to follow the manufacturer's driver and inst uh, software instructions, and then we need to check our computer's sound settings. In any case, though, whether it's an, an interface built into the radio or an external sound card, we need to make sure that the sound card we're using for WSJTX is not the sound card that's designated as the default sound device in your computer's control panel settings. So you wanna make sure that it's not using all the other sounds in the computer using that device. 
you need to set your computer's internal sound card, the one you're not using for WSJTX, as a default. You need to install then the WSJTX software, time synchronization software, as I mentioned earlier, and I've listed a couple here, but there are a few others. And if you want to use the helper software, JT Alert or Alarm JT. As you can see, most of the screenshots I have here are from a Windows-based computer, so they're slightly different on Linux and, and, my, and Macintosh iOS, but uh, they are pretty much the same thing. And if you go to the full presentation, again, which is a tiny.cc slash FT8, FT4, there's a series of about eight more slides that show each of the settings uh, screens one by one to help you go through the settings. I don't have time for it in this presentation. It's very important before you start the WSJTX software that you have your USB cables all connected, you have all your devices connected, and that you have your radio turned on. If you don't turn your radio on every time before you start WSJTX, it'll immediately try and reconfigure itself. So always make sure everything is turned on, not just the first time, but every time before you start the WSJTX software. If you have multiple radios, you can create multiple WSJTX configurations for each of the different radios, or if you have different operators in your family and you want different operator setups for each of those. A couple of operating tips. The uh, first one is to reduce the power settings on your radio to avoid overheating your transmitter. Remember, these are continuous operational modes, more like RIDI and AM, as opposed to single sideband and CW, so you want to make sure that your radio is capable of handling that. Also, straight from the FCC rules, use the minimum transmit power necessary to carry out the desired communications. Because these uh, modes work with very low, low or weak signals, you usually don't need a lot of power. So again, use the ma maximum power needed uh, to make successful communications. Make sure your radio, radio's filtering, audio filtering settings are set for maximum bandwidth, you should turn off all speech processing, noise blanking, DSP settings, et cetera, on your radio. You don't need any of those, and those will only harm or hamper your operation. If things aren't working, I put together a slide here, and you may want to print out a copy of this slide from the full presentation and put it in your shack so when you start scratching your head. Uh, and I know this slide's a little bit long, but let's go over each of the items. The first thing is if it stops working, check your computer sound card settings, especially after Windows updates. If they get changed to the default settings or one of the sound cards get turn, turned off, it'll cause it not to work. If you're seeing stations or you're not even decoding any stations but hearing stations on your radio, check the time synchronization. Very important. You need to be in a, within about a half a second or less time synchronized to everyone else. If you get up to two seconds, you'll start not being able to decode other stations or make contacts. You need to make sure your radio bandwidth filter is set at maximum, and some of the radios will change this when you switch to other modes. So with my Elecraft K3S, when I operate RIDI, it automatically narrows that mode. So when I switch back to uh, FT8 or FT4, I need to make sure it's set for the maximum width. Is the radio in the correct mode? Uh, your radio, depending on its modes that are available, will either be displaying USB or some data mode when it's operating. Make sure it's in the correct mode for your radio. Is WSJTX in the correct mode? A friend of mine just called and said, it all stopped working, and he wasn't on FT8 or FT4. He was set on JT4, which is another mode in the WSJTX suite, and that's not the one he needed for where he was trying to operate. So make sure you're in the right mode. Uh, there's three boxes, which we'll talk a little bit about later, that you want to make sure check to hold t transmit frequency, call first, and auto sequence. And again, there's a special operating activity um, mode for field day or for fox and hound modes. And if you're not operating those, you want to make sure that's not selected. So let's go through the basic operations by looking at some screenshots for WSJTX. And again, these will be very similar for FT8 or FT4. You can notice at the top we have a set of menus. And if the menus disappear, that means that this little checkbox down here that says menus has been unchecked. If that's unchecked, these will disappear. So that's your first troubleshooting thing. If those menus are not there and you need to see them, click on this. That, that box is there so you can remove the menus to get maximum screen space. Because you're going to find as you start getting very busy frequencies, uh, you're going to get a lot of decoded signals. So you want a maximum amount of screen space to be able to see those. This window on the upper left here is our stations being received. The window on the right is the stations that we're in communication with. And we'll go into more details on those screens in a few moments. Also, here's where we change our band and mode. Here's the band and mode we're on. 
I'm sorry, the band and frequency we're on. And uh, then we have the current mode listed at the bottom here. So let's go through some of these individual things. So once we start the program, the first thing we want to do is go to the top menu and choose whether we want FT8 or FT4. The next thing we want to do is choose the band we want to operate on. And we go down to this band change button here, click on the drop down menu, and all the frequencies are listed for each of the bands that we would operate on with these modes. And these frequencies will change depending on whether you're on FT8 or FT4. So right now I'm uh, moving from 20 meters and selecting the frequency for 30 meters. When I do that, it'll automatically change my radio's frequency and will be ready to operate. If you need to enter a non-standard frequency, such as for a de-expedition, you can simply highlight the area where it says 20 meters and type in the exact frequency with a decimal point. So typing in 14.090 will change the radio to that new frequency. Our display that's normally yellow on black for the frequency will change to yellow on red to indicate we're using a non-standard frequency. Uh, there are three boxes I mentioned earlier that you want to check for most operations. You can change these in some sets, but I'll just suggest that you start with them all, che all checked as a novice operator. So they are hold the transmit frequency because we don't want to transmit, we don't want to change our transmit frequency when we respond to a station by double clicking on it. Auto sequence will send the correct report after we make our initial contact. And if we're CQing, it's necessary that we have the call first selected. If we don't have that selected, when we call CQ, it won't answer. When someone responds, it won't respond with a signal report to the responding station. One of the most important things about starting out with WFT with FT8 or FT4 is you don't want to call stations on their transmitting frequency. So you want to set your transmit frequency different than theirs. And the way you do that is you look at the band chart, the waterfall, and you right click on it in an empty spot where no one's transmitting. You don't only not want to transmit on the station you're trying to call. You don't want to transmit on the frequency that anyone else is using. You want a clear spot so people can hear you. So let's go through some basic uh, display of receiving. These are stations we're receiving and each time I have it set and this is one of the settings you can also change. It sends a blank line with the band uh, displayed on it to show me that it started a new sent sequence of decodes. So these are all the decodes that took place during this 15, 15 second interval and we notice here that we have some different color coding, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But I want to show you that these stations that I'm pointing to are calling CQ. Now you notice this station is in green, this station's in green, but this one has a gray background on it. The gray background means that this is a station I've already talked to before. It just helps me know who I've already talked to before. Right here, it's very important. We're seeing two stations. Which station are we actually copying? We're actually copying receiving the UA3 station and he's sending 73 to this Fox 5 station. Well we're not hearing the, the, the French station because he's transmitting on the other, other interval. We're, uh, we're listening on the, on the even or odd inter intervals. In this case we're hearing this station so if we would double click on this it will try and transmit to the UA3 station not the F5 station. Very important. Same thing on this one. This is an M0 sending a signal report to a JA. This is an EA3 station sending a 73 to a Poly station. And again, the gray color just indicates that it's a station that I've worked before. The other window on the right are stations we're communicating through. And let's just go through a basic uh, operation of calling CQ. So you can see here I'm calling CQ and it's in, or it's in yellow. CQ and I'm sending my call sign followed by my grid square and that's sent automatically. That's the automatic signals that's sent. When a station responds to me, WSJTX will recognize that my call sign is in the response and it'll change the color to red. And you'll see here that K uh, W8SIC is answering me and he's sending his grid square. I then respond here in yellow. I send W8SIC. This is K8ZT you are plus 12, that's his signal report. He responds to me with, Roger, I got your signal report and you're minus 10. I then send 73 and I uh, would then see the next screen showing him 70, sending 73, but I took the screenshot a little too quick here. Uh, 
Notice down here, I had originally selected CQ and I had able, enabled transmit and I had the call first set when I started. And that's what starts the sequence of me calling CQ. The call first means I will respond when someone answers me and that auto sequencing means I'll send the right sequence of reports. Let's look now at us answering someone else's CQ. So right here, we have a CQ by K4 uh, IIA. He's calling CQ, and you notice that when I double click on him, right here, I send my call sign followed by EN91, right here, the yellow part. If he answers me, then we see it in red, and I'll see it on both sides, in both the received area and in the, uh, in the, uh, the uh, communications area over here of the stations I'm talking to. So he's answered me with a signal report. I then send him a Roger to acknowledge his signal report and send his signal report. He sends me a 73, I send him a 73. Now don't get confused that it's showing up in both windows. You'll notice you're still decoding everyone else. So that's one of the neat things. You're decoding not only the station you're receiving in, in communication with, but you're receiving all, you're decoding all the other stations while you're receiving. Of course, while you're transmitting, you're not receiving anyone. So that will only show up the stations that when you're in the receiving mode. It's not a full duplex mode. There's a special few, special, there are a few special modes available, as I mentioned earlier. And you go into the settings and then the advanced tab, and you can choose to go into a special operating activity and then pick your activity. For D expeditions, a lot of times it's the fox and hound mode. You're the hound, they're the fox, so you'd want to choose hound for your mode, or an AWRL field day or VHF contest. This will change the auto sequence of what you send uh, each time in response and when you're calling CQ and answering CQ. So again, these are special operating modes and you want those only on when you're operating in those special modes. Uh, another operating tip, after you transmit a few times, you can use an online site such as PSK Reporter to check to make sure your signal is getting out and the other stations are decoding you. So this is a map shows all the stations that are decoding you. And what happens is they're feeding this information back to a website, uh, but they're receiving you on their radio. So there might be someone sitting there, they might not. This doesn't mean you're making contact with them. This just means they're receiving. So you notice here, this was 23 hours ago, because you can display up to 24 hours. And this station was receiving Steve and 8 LGP at minus 15 dB. You can notice this station, this was three hours ago and it was minus seven. And if you hover over any of these, you can see the actual station display a lot easier. It'll give you the details of the station, the location, et cetera. So that's the very quick uh, presentation. But what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna actually bring up the program real quick and let you see what it looks like in person. And I'll go through a couple steps here. So I'm gonna switch bands right now. We're switching to 20 meters. You won't hear this because the sound is muted, but you really don't need to hear the sound. And right now we are on FT8. Uh, so you'll see that this has a 15 second cycle that we're going through right here. So we're halfway through receiving. When we get to about 12 and a half, it'll start decoding stations. These are all stations that were decoded in that past. I'm not gonna go up and switch modes to FT4. And that we'll now notice that instead of 12 seconds, we're gonna get a seven and a half seconds. So it's a little bit faster display. And uh, there's a few less stations there. So let's double click on one to try and answer a CQ. And I'm gonna adjust my antenna a little bit to aim a little bit better towards him. I notice I transmitted over here. He did not respond to me. Uh, so I'm going to transmit again. So it'll keep on transmitting until it times out. I think I have it set at six transmissions. We'll see if anyone else comes up a little bit stronger here. This line right, this column right here shows how strong the signals are. No, he just answered me. So WSJTX shows me in red that he gave me a minus eight. I then responded, Roger, I got your minus eight. You're a plus 10 here. And now we'll go through another cycle and he hopefully will get my information. He sends me a 73 and also this program pops up and says you need to log that. So I click the okay button. I then send him a 73 and we have now completed a contact on FT4 with this station. And I can let this continue here. And if someone heard me, they could have been calling me uh, now also, but we'll see other stations here. So that's typically how it works. On the bottom here, we're looking at the JT alert software 
and it's showing us stations and it's pulling the information from an online site such as qrz.com to show me what the states are and the gray stations mean that I've worked them before and if I hover my mouse over it'll show me details of that station so this station's in Maryland let's try answering him even though he's not real strong we'll try answering him you notice I just double clicked on the wrong station so let's try that again and we'll probably not get him this round about anyway so let's choose another station or double click on him. I'm going to double click on this LU8 and I've worked him before but I could still work him again and we'll see if he answers me and we won't spend a lot of time doing this. I'll have to limit my time here. So we're going to hold our transmission and not send any more and return back to our slideshow. And again, uh, tiny.cc slash FT8 FT4 is the place to get all the information. And I'd like to thank you for attending QSO today, Virtual Expo 2020. Now we'll have questions.